I hope you're hungry because I may have some recipes to add to your next Sunday dinner. Let's count down our top 10 list of unusual things people ate to survive during the world wars. Number 10, rationing. So I think it's important to begin this list by talking about rationing. Lots of food was sent away to help the soldiers going off to fight in the war. That means that each person only had a certain amount of coupons that they were allowed to use to buy things like eggs, sugar, flour, etc. There were less shipments coming from other companies due to the threat of U-boat attacks. So food became really expensive and people panicked, rushing to stores to stock up. In 1918, the government decided to introduce rationing so as to develop a way to share food fairly. That way grocery stores didn't face a ridiculous shortage of toilet paper. Hmm. Even the king and queen of England had ration cards, and the cards could only be used at certain shops. If you were caught stealing or cheating, then you could be fined or even thrown into prison. Fortunately, nobody starved, but people were often left hungrier than usual. To aid with that missing spot in their tummy, people began cultivating their own gardens, and preserved jams, pickles, and chutneys became really, really popular. Number 9. Vegetarian Chopped Liver so with rations and war being introduced, people had to get used to a whole different way of life. If they were craving one of their favorites for dinner, they had to get inventive. Hence, vegetarian chopped liver. It won't surprise you to learn that during World War II, a lot of Jewish families in occupied territories were advised to stretch their food rations very thin, which often meant filling in a recipe with something a lot cheaper. Chopped liver was a staple dish, so to find a way to fill the gap, they created a vegetarian version. They found a way to make it, kind of, using fresh fruit fruits, vegetables, meat was swapped out for green beans, peas, onions, hard boiled eggs if possible, and crackers. Number 8. Mock Goose So the war is on, rations are in play, but Christmas is still coming, and hey guys, it's Thanksgiving this weekend too. Happy Thanksgiving Americans! What on earth was going to take the place of a delicious roast Christmas goose? Well, I introduced to you Mock Goose. I'm just realizing that World War eras were actually pretty vegetarian friendly, because no one could really afford meat. Mock Goose was a combination of sliced potatoes, apples, cheese, sage, vegetable stock, and a teaspoon of flour. They would place a layer of sliced potatoes, then apples, sage, seasoning, cheese, and then repeat. Basically a potato, apple, and cheese lasagna. I'm glad they didn't try to make it look like a goose because it's almost worse eating something that doesn't taste what it looks like, you know? Number 7. War Cake Though the recipe was printed in the Second World War, it also made the rounds in World War I. People weren't going to stop craving delicious tea cakes and sweets just because of the war. If anything, it made them crave it more. But they had to make do with what they had. Recipes like this one often appeared in women's magazines as food conservation was seen as a way women contributed to the war effort. Canadian war cake goes as follows. And though the ingredients don't seem that odd, the making was a bit strange. It includes two cups of sugar, two cups of hot water, 3 tablespoons of lard or a fat, 1 teaspoon of salt, cloves, cinnamon, seedless raisins, not a raisin fan. This would then all be boiled together and then cooled. They would boil that together. I've never actually read a recipe like that at all. Then 4 cups of flour would be added and a tablespoon of soda and baking powder. The consistency of the cake was closer to that of a dense bread, but when you've got to take it day by day, it was a small joy. Number 6, the potato pasty. Potatoes! I love potatoes. Easy to grow, versatile, tasty. Potatoes became the go-to saviors of many a recipe. The British government even handed out leaflets encouraging people to get inventive with the potato. There were recipes from the normal baked potatoes, biscuits, and even something called a potato piglet which was supposed to substitute, somehow, a sausage roll. But then of course there was the potato pasty. It was a pie pastry which contained margarine or a fat, fat was also really hard to come by, flour, potato and salt. They had to eat it as soon as it was hot as it had a tendency to dry up once it cooled down. They also used potatoes in general with other recipes to make them more filling. Number 5. National Flour While flour was sometimes, sometimes permitted, flour wasn't encouraged and was one time banned for household use. It was still being allowed commercially for like other cakes and biscuits and stuff. But they had to supply a replacement so wartime specific products were launched. One was called the National Flour Wheat Meal essentially. It was grey in colour and had a lot of bran in it. It wasn't as smooth or as soft as flour, so women would desperately like sieve it through their stockings to kind of get like a nice like desired soft texture. Didn't always work. They also used this as a way to feed their chickens without having to spend money on rations. This flour was the key ingredient as to what would be called the national loaf. Nutritionists, funny enough, loved it for some reason because it was like really high in fiber and tried to fight for the bread to be popular post-war. But unfortunately, it wasn't very tasty. It sucked. 
It was often referred to as Hitler's secret weapon because everyone hated it so much. On the upside though, the government was able to keep the supply plentiful enough, so bread was never rationed. Number 4 Spam Oh Spam The canned meat people still seem to love. The British tradition for mealtime was to have at least one meat and two veg. You can guess what stood in for the meat. Spam. The government tried to introduce the Brits to corned beef, an insult. So then they tried something called Snowick, which was like a snake mackerel from South Africa. People didn't even like to talk about that one. But then Spam came over from the US. It was filling and tasty, just enough to fill that little spot in their tummy. Although it couldn't replace a good steak, it had a long shelf life, and it was perfect for troops in the trenches. Number three, pig and chicken clubs. One of the things I love about England or the UK in general is that everyone, even in suburban neighborhoods, have chickens in their backyard. Okay, maybe not everyone, but it's really, really popular and it's kind of normal. My aunt has always kept them in her backyard since as far back as I can remember, but it wasn't always like that. In the 1940s, commercially farmed hens had to be sold off as food because they didn't have enough to feed them. This led to a massive egg shortage. Only one egg was allowed per person per week. Unless you were expecting mother, you were allowed two. But as a result, people who hadn't kept chickens before this started to in their backyards. You had to give up your egg ration, but got to have more grain rations instead. The same thing happened with pigs. Neighborhoods would keep pigs, feed them together, and then share in them. Some would even keep their pigs private, but they had to be registered so you could give up your meat coupons, but some never did. So a little bit cheeky. Number two, Roosevelt coffee. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. Some days I really couldn't do this job without coffee. Like I, I really couldn't, it's a problem. And I'm sure many people feel the same, but sadly for them, back then, coffee was rationed. Pretty much every ounce of coffee was shipped overseas, making coffee impossible to come by in the States. Americans were tasked with drinking less than one cup a day. That's like compared to everyone else's four cups a day. Introducing Roosevelt coffee. People started making it to help fill in the gap. It was simply reused coffee grounds mixed with ingredients like chicory and posthum. It made a kind of watery version of a cup of joe. The chicory added a little spice to it while posthum, a molasses-like substance, added color and flavor, I guess? It wasn't a good time. But last but not least, Hershey's chocolate. The men who took up arms in the trenches faced some of the worst horrors ever imagined. To them, any day, any moment could be their last. A pretty bleak world to live in day in and day out. Morale was crucial to maintain as it could mean the difference between life and death for many soldiers. One way to help support them was food. On June 6, 1944, the Allies stormed the beaches of Normandy during the D-Day invasion. But what you may not know is that an unlikely treat fueled them throughout the mission. Hershey's chocolate bars. Hershey's was approached by the US Army in 1937, way long before the war started, about creating a bar for emergency rations. They had to weigh four ounces, be high in energy, withstand high temperatures, and taste a little better than a boiled potato. They didn't want it to be too tasty, otherwise they'd run out. It was called the D Ration Bar, a blend of chocolate, sugar, cocoa butter, skim milk, and oat flour. And it ended up not tasting too great, but it gave the allies enough oomph to seize the day. And there you have it folks, our top 10 list of unusual things people ate to survive during the world wars. Any of these recipes worth trying? Let me know in the comments, or have you tried them? I don't know. Be sure to like and follow to stay a part of the hive. I've been your host, Rachel Fisher, and until next time, stay sweet peas.